Christ for the world we sing. The world to Christ we bring with fervent prayer. The wayward and the lost by restless passions tossed, redeemed at countless cost from dark despair. Christ for the With one accord, with us the work to share, with us reproach to damn, with us the cross to bear, for Christ our Lord. Hello, welcome to our Bible study. My name is Clint McElroy, and today we'll be in John chapter 18. We will be meeting today at 10 a.m., so please join us if you can. Masks will be provided at the door for anyone who needs one. If you're sick in any way, please don't come to the auditorium, but instead stay home and enjoy the streaming service. We'll also be having classes this morning, so please join us for those if you'd like to. And you're welcome to join us at 9 a.m. in the auditorium to watch this Bible study on the large screen. We also want to make available these English Standard Version Bibles from the World Bible School. If you care to have one, please let our church office know and we'll make arrangements to get you one. We have many on the sick list this week, so please refer to our bulletin for more information. We want to continue in our sympathies for the families of Bobby Chenault and Marjorie Vickers, who both passed away late last week, and their funerals were this past week. We want to extend our sympathies to the family of Athena Animogiannis and her passing this past week, the great grandniece of Betty and Felton Smith. Also keep Betty and Felton in your prayers as they travel to and from Georgia to be with the family. Our sympathies are also extended to the family of Taya Misa, an elder of the Church of Lupalele, where David Willis is working in American Samoa. Please keep these families in your prayers. We want to call to your attention Devin Lloyd, who's had some issues that we need to pray about. We want to remember Katha Berry. We want to remember Doyle and Linda Garrett, as Doyle is suffering and Linda's taking care of him. We want to remember Victor, Glenna, and Glenna's mother, Brenda. Victor's had some test results that they're concerned about, and Brenda's having some health issues as well. And we want to continue to remember Janet Fisher and Bill Lewis in our prayers. We're thankful to hear that Sharon Payton is recovering quickly from her surgery. She's home recovering. As I was editing the video, I realized that I had not included Arvis Buchanan, my father-in-law, and the prayer requests He's of Leonard, Texas. They determined late last week that he had a mass in his cranium the size of a golf ball that's instead of a softball, as I may have told some people. And they are going to remove it on Monday at 9 a.m. It is not cancerous, but they do want to get it out of there because it's putting pressure on his brain, causing some problems in his day-to-day -day activities. So please keep him, Arvis Buchanan, and his wife Kay in your prayers as he recovers. As is our custom, we want to call into remembrance the story of the two men on the road to Emmaus who were joined by a third man on their way. When they got to their destination and parted, they realized that he was the resurrected Christ, and they remembered that while he was with them, there had been a burning in their hearts. They came to understand that that burning was there because of his presence with them. It's that burning that they had in their hearts that we hope to kindle in our own hearts as we draw closer to the Lord through a study of his word seeking to find out what his desire is for us in this life as his servants. We also call into remembrance the admonitions of Leviticus chapter 19 and other places where we're called to be holy for the Lord our God is holy. And how can we be holy unless we know what holiness is? We go to the scriptures to find out what that is and what it means for us. And finally, we want to call into remembrance the story of Rehoboam, Jeroboam, and the prophet that came to Jeroboam. Rehoboam's is a story where we learn the wise approach to addressing issues that come up in our lives. We should go to those who have experience, who understand and have had some success in addressing concerns that have arisen, even if they're not exactly similar to what we're facing, in place of going to young, inexperienced people who have opinions. 
that may or may not be founded on anything that's true and reliable. Jeroboam's story is slightly different. He had a promise from God, very similar to David's, and that if he had led the kingdom of Israel under his control, the northern tribes, appropriately, his kingdom would have continued and prospered as God had promised David. Instead, when Jeroboam took control of those northern tribes, he was concerned that people going into the south, into Jerusalem and the south kingdom of Judah to worship God would be a problem for him and leading the northern tribes. So he built high places in the mountains and told the people of Israel that the Lord God that had led them out of Egypt wanted them to go up to these high places to worship him there instead of in Jerusalem. This was an abomination before the Lord. And he sent a messenger, a prophet from Judah to go to him and explain to him that this was not acceptable behavior and that he needed to correct himself. And that prophet went there and told Jeroboam that he was doing incorrectly. Jeroboam heard the message, but he did not heed the message. He went ahead and did what was incorrect before the Lord. And it was an abomination before the Lord for generations to come until the time of Jesus. Every king of Israel was found to be unacceptable because they failed to rid their kingdom, the northern kingdom of this abomination before the Lord. Now that prophet, once he availed himself of the obligation of delivering that message to Jeroboam, was to go home by a different path. And on his way home, a prophet from Israel came to him and told him that God had told him that he should come and have supper with him. This was a lie. The man just wanted to have the honor of having this prophet from God visit with him. Well, the prophet from Judah believed that lie, and it was wrong before the Lord, and the Lord demanded his life because of that. It's a terrible thing to present a lie. Jeroboam presented a lie to the people of Israel and led them astray from the righteous path before the Lord for centuries. And this prophet had an intention of bringing glory to himself, the prophet from Israel, and in doing so, he caused the death of this honorable prophet because that prophet believed him. It's a, it's a terrible, terrible thing to realize that not just the telling of a lie is a bad thing before the Lord, but listening to a lie and believing it is also wrong before the Lord. We have an obligation to make sure that what we have chosen to believe before the Lord is correct and in accord with his will. We do that by going to his word. We take what we hear from those places we hear messages, and we should listen to all those messages and compare those things to what the Lord has said in his word. And those things that are in accord with his word, we can believe to be true and believe the messenger that brought them. But those things that are not in accord with his word, we should not believe to be true. And we should be very careful of that messenger that brings us that message. So I hope that you will find today that the things I've told you will be true and in accord with what you find in Scripture. If that's not the case, I hope that you will bring that to me and let me know, and we'll figure out what is right and true together. So I hope you'll join me now as we enter this study of John chapter 18. We're going to read the first part of it. We won't complete the chapter because it's a very long chapter, and we'll continue the rest of it next week. John chapter 18 from the English Standard Version. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the brook Kidron, where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. Verse 3. So Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priest and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, whom do you seek? Verse 5. They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Verse 7. So he asked them again, Whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you seek me, let these men go. Verse 9. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken of those whom you gave me, I have lost not one. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Verse 11. So Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? 
verse 12. So the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. First they led him to Annas, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had advised the Jews that it would be expedient that one man should die for the people. Verse 15. Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he entered with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter stood outside at the door. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the servant girl who kept watch at the door and brought Peter in. Verse 17. The servant girl at the door said to Peter, You also are not one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the servants and the officers had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing and warming themselves. Peter also was with them, standing and warming himself. Verse 19. The high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teachings. Jesus answered him, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in the synagogues and in the temple where all Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I have said to them. They know what I said. When he had said these things, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus with his hand, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, If what I said is wrong, bear witness about the wrong. But if what I said is right, why do you strike me? Annas then sent him bound to Caiaphas the high priest. Verse 25. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. So they said to him, You also are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter again denied it, and at once the rooster crowed. Okay, we'll stop there and pick up with Jesus before Pilate next week. Last week we studied chapter 17, which is a prayer Jesus made about the apostles, about the disciples these men who were standing there with him right before these events of chapter 18. This is at the end of several chapters of Jesus commenting to the disciples about what was about to happen. And the way we read it, it makes it very hard to understand how they may have understood these same things. They weren't understanding these things as Jesus was telling them to them through these chapters. They did not understand that Jesus was about to be taken. Jesus had made it clear that that was what was going to happen, but there was not a way for them to understand it. So they did not expect these things to happen in chapter 18 that are about to happen. So he's telling them time and again these, cha these things in chapters 14, 15, and 16, and even 13, to give them some preparation for this time that's about to occur when he's going to be taken by the authorities and crucified. There was really nothing that could prepare them for that event, and Jesus was concerned that they would be taken either spiritually or physically. And we see that in the passage that we read today, that he was making accommodations for that very thing. Here we have in chapter 17 this prayer that he began after having finished the conversation with the disciples in chapter 16. He lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is to come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. Since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him, and this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. A powerful statement about what it means to be one who has been given eternal life. That is a very different thing than what you might expect, given the nature of the rest of the New Testament. It's a simply truly knowing that there is a God and that Jesus Christ was sent by him. And that is eternal life by Jesus' own definition here. It's a powerful thing. And it explains what that means because it's more than just knowing that you've read something somewhere. It's internally knowing that this is true. And it changes the way you behave in every aspect of your life. And I'm not there yet. I mean, I'm not, I've not perfected that, that understanding and believing that. I'm working on it, 
and I, I don't know that any, anyone has perfected it, but that's what that is. The true belief that God is and that Jesus Christ is his son, that's what we're working on. That's what we're truly working to achieve, this full knowledge and belief that this is true and one that is evidenced by the actions that we take in our life. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do in verse 4. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. In case you didn't understand, Jesus was from the beginning, as John said in the very first chapter. Jesus was with God as they began to create what was created. I have manifested your name in verse 6 to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them, and have come to know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine and I am glorified in them. I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. It's a powerful, again, another powerful statement about the oneness of God and our inclusion in that as believers, as those who would believe. Now, this is specific, again, to the disciples that are here, and a special prayer for them to be especially encouraged in the in the time that they're about to face but this does extend to us also as believers not us as disciples who were standing there with him so there is a difference but there are parts of this promise that absolutely are ours as well while i was with them i kept them in your name which you have given me i've guarded them and not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction that the scripture might be fulfilled again jesus was very uncomfortable about Judas being lost. Uh, if he could have been saved, I think Jesus would have found a way to save him. But now I am coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Once we accept that Jesus is the Christ, and we make that part of our life, we are no longer of the world. And the world will set its aim at us. The world will come at us to wreak destruction in our lives in whatever way that it can. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. Very important. We're not to be separate and apart from the world and our physical ability to represent here. We are to be in the world, but not of the world. They are not of the world, just as I'm not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Jesus is the word. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. For And for their sake, I consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified in truth. Powerful, powerful things to be said about these men. And it, it applies to us once we believe as well. Verse 20, I do not ask for these also, not just these disciples, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. That's you and me. That's anybody who hears this word. They're hearing it because of the actions and deeds of the apostles and the disciples that were with Jesus who believed and made a massive change in the world. It didn't change a little bit. It changed the world. And it continues to change the world through those who will truly believe and act on it. And that's you and me. When we accept that the Lord is God, and that Jesus is his word manifested in this world to save us. Well, that's a powerful thing that we have and we can give to others. And it's a powerful thing that has and will continue to change the world in which we live. Don't lose hope. Whatever you're facing, whatever challenge it is, don't lose hope. The message of God is changing and it will change your life and those who need that message in their life around you that they may all be one just as you father are in me and i in you that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me 
right back to what he'd been saying. Love one another so that the world will see me and God in you and your actions. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them that they may be one even as we are one. I and them and you and me that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you love me. Almost sounds like a Beatles song. In fact, I think that may be where they got the inspiration for one of the lyrics in one of their songs. But it's true. That's what Jesus was talking about. And it, it's kind of, it is kind of difficult to read because of the complexity of the relationships that he's speaking of there. Not the complexity of the relationships themselves, but the, how complicated the multiplicity of the relationships are. There, there's Jesus and God and God and Jesus and then us and God and God and us Jesus and us and us and Jesus these things are all part of this being one if you are one there is no differentiation between the one thing and the other verse 24 father I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you love me before the foundation of the world that goes right back to John chapter 1, Genesis chapter 1, 1. All of creation was still to come, and Jesus was there with God, and God loved Jesus and wanted what is occurring here in chapters 18 and 19 to happen for that creation, even when he's laying the foundations of the world. It's very difficult for us to fathom. Verse 25, O righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I made known to them your name, and will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. He abides in us if we abide in him. That continuation goes forward. And chapter 18. When Jesus has spoken these words, he went with his disciples across the brook Kidron, Across the Kidron Valley, where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. Now, this was a place he went regularly, and Judas knew that as well. So, Judas uh, procured a band of soldiers, and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees came with him. And I would imagine there were more than just the officers there, there were several members of the council there with them. They went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. And he said to them, I am he. Judas, who had betrayed them, was standing there with them. In verse 6, Jesus said to them, I am he. They drew back and fell to the ground. They were shocked, I suppose, that he would so readily acknowledge in the face of that much authority that he was the one they were seeking. They says that they fell to the ground. They were startled. So so he said again, Whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus said, I told you that I am he. And this is where he's making that accommodation. So if you seek me, let these men go. So it was less of the men running and more of, God, of Jesus making sure that they left his presence at that moment so that they wouldn't be taken with him and crucified. And that is a little distinction that I have missed time and again in the years of reading this. I've never really noticed that. Jesus didn't get left behind. He had these men leave so that they would not be exposed to this danger. And this was what he had been talking about all along, that they would leave his presence and feel guilty about having left. They would feel miserable and they'd feel like failures. And that's not what he wanted for them. He wanted them to understand that this was necessary. This was a good thing. That Once these things had transpired, all that had been promised would come to pass and it would be fulfilled and done. It's a shocking realization that everything that was won was won in that resurrection, the crucifixion and resurrection. So it continues in verse 9, This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken of those whom you gave me, I have lost not one. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant, cut off his right ear, and this is, of course, something we find in other of, uh, other of the Gospels. I'm not trying to make a medley of the Gospels here so you can go there and read those accounts and see how they differ slightly. 
Uh, in this case, he does cut off the ear, but we don't see the miracle of Jesus restoring the ear, but that is recorded elsewhere. And we have the name of that servant as Malchus, and I think that's probably very significant to the first century Christians. I think that that would have been a name that they knew well by the point that uh, perhaps John wrote this book. Don't know that for sure. I just suspect that many of the names that we get are here for a very good reason, and a lot of times that is not so obvious to us now, 20 centuries later. Jesus says, Put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? That's a powerful statement, and it's one that's kind of lost on us from time to time as we pass through the events of life. Sometimes we forget that life events happen, and we to expect that the, the things that face everyone will not face as well, we will face those things. We should not expect to do otherwise. Take satisfaction that the Lord has saved us, that the Lord is making provision for us, even when we may feel uncomfortable, when we may feel threatened, the Lord has provided, and the Lord is taking care and doing His will through us. And that is a wondrous and glorious thing. And perhaps we won't see it in this life, Perhaps we'll have to suffer even unto death, as many in the first century did. But what a glorious thing to be able to do that. Stay true to God's word. Stay true to his purpose. And keep the faith. What a powerful, powerful thing. So the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. First they led him to Annas, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had advised the Jews that it would be expedient that one man should die for the people. So the high priest had this gift of prophecy and had prophesied even without realizing it. And that was Caiaphas as recorded in an earlier chapter. Peter denies then in verse 15 that he was one of the followers of Jesus when confronted in the courtyard. And we see this little game, word game that uh, John plays you know, uh, about himself when he identifies his disciples I'm relatively certain that any time we see the name or the phrase the disciple that the Lord loved or the disciple that was known to someone or that or the other as an identifier that we're actually reading that John was the person in that circumstance. So if we're reading that that way, then in verse 15, it's both Peter and John that remained. Peter was uh, not known to the high priest, so John passed with the group into the court of the high priest and, and Peter stayed outside. John made provisions to get him brought inside. When the person who was coming to do that went and talked to Peter and asked him if he was one of the disciples, Peter denied it and he managed to come in anyway. And then he stood with some of the officers that had been there and servants of the house uh, at a charcoal fire to warm himself. And then it goes back to Jesus in the, in the presence of the high priest. The high priest questioned about his teaching, what he had been teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly in verse 20 to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I have said to them. They know what I have said. They know what I said. So it was not an unlogical thing. If the accusation has been made that he's taught something inappropriate, then bring the accusers that have made that accusation. Don't ask him what he said. He's not made any secret of his teachings. So where are those who have accused me of teaching something improper is the way I read that, what he's asking them. When he made this statement in verse 22, one of the officers standing nearby struck Jesus with his hand saying, is that how you answer the high priest? So again, this is a slightly different accounting than we read in other Gospels. But Jesus answers him, If what I said is wrong, bear witness about the wrong. But if what I say is right, why do you strike me? It's a logical question. Why? I'm not no disrespect in what I said. I'm simply saying, if there's an accusation against me, bring the accuser. The accuser is responsible to make the accusation. I'm not responsible to tell you what they accuse me of. That's a perfectly logical thing, I think, even under their legal system. But this, uh, this one who was standing near struck him. Annas uh, then sent him bound to Caiaphas the high priest. And then we go back to Simon Peter standing at the fire warming himself. 
Another of those standing there said, Are you not one of his disciples? He said, No, I'm not. And then another pre, uh, another servant there who was a relative of Malchus who had, had his ear cut off by Peter said, Did I not see you in the garden with him? So there were a significant number of people there in the garden. So even this eyewitness had uh, been there in the presence of the company there and seen Peter had seen Peter do this thing to uh, the servant Malchus. But again, Peter denied it. And here we don't hear anything about doing it with a curse or anything. And at once the rooster crowed. Now, it is an interesting thing to go and compare this to the other accounts. But uh, remember that the other accounts are kind of secondhand. John was in the, in the facility. He was standing nearby, even if he may not have been in the immediate vicinity of these occurrences. He was in the building, so to speak. So he had uh, a much higher identification of what was a true and accountable. So we'll stop there and we'll pick up next week with the rest of this. There are many interesting things in the next section. We'll next week probably read uh, the rest of chapter 18 and a significant portion of chapter 19, which is also quite long. And then we'll... Uh, finish up chapter 19 the week after. I hope you found a word of encouragement in today's message. There are many things here in this passage that are very interesting if we want to delve into them and research them and compare them to not only the Gospels but some of the prophecies uh, that are in the Old Testament about Jesus are being fulfilled throughout all these events. So I hope you've uh, been able to take something away that you will help you in your walk this coming week. We will be meeting today at 10 a.m., so please join us if you can. Hope to see you there. Again, if you're sick in any way, please don't come up to the auditorium, but instead stay home and enjoy the streaming service. God bless. Have a great week.